It's a critical today, not just in India, but around the world after very promising news from Oxford University uh, of how effective the Oxford uh, vaccine candidate is in the fight against COVID-19. It's a drug being uh, produced uh, by AstraZeneca, but it's going to be manufactured over here in India in huge numbers by the Serum Institute of India. Um, the full efficacy of the drug is seen to be as much as 90% depending on the dosage which is given. And joining us now to tell us about the progress which has been made on this very important day, Adar Poonawala, he's the uh, CEO of the Serum Institute. Uh, great to speak to you again, Adar. A, a, a couple of weeks back, uh, you, we, you were waiting in a sense for more news to emerge from Oxford. That news has come today that in certain conditions, this drug, which you are set to manufacture in India, could be 90% effective. What are those conditions in which it would be 90% effective? So, Vishnu, I think, uh, you know, whether a vaccine is 60 or 70 percent, 90 percent, at this stage where only a few thousand people in these phase three trials, you know, have shown this kind of efficacy result, I would not want to, you know, label the vaccine to be at that level at this stage, because um, even though, yes, we are showing 90 percent efficacy with a half dose and then followed by a full dose, which sounds a bit peculiar that why is that giving you a much better result? That is how it is. And as the days go on, we'll probably get an explanation for that. So indeed, that's good news. But what I mean to say is that unless hundreds of millions of people get the vaccine all over the world in different regions, and you see the disease burden in that region actually going down, like we've seen for pneumonia vaccines, measles vaccines, uh, pentavalent vaccines, etc., you know, you don't, you can't really say a vaccine is effective up to a certain level until you are able to see that data. And of course, that will come about in the next one or two years. But initially, having said that, there's a lot of excitement, whether it's Moderna's vaccine, Pfizer's vaccine, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine and others, that at least, you know, the fear was initially, will any of these new vaccines being developed within a year, will they even have 50, 60 percent uh, efficacy? So, you know, we're way beyond that uh, benchmark. And uh, that's great because, you know, that's what you need to get ahead of the pandemic, um, uh, which is, you know, uh, stopped us right. in all, all the countries. Adar, it's my understanding that the first vaccine triggers um, an immune response, which is why the second dose is more effective, taking you up potentially to 90%. Is that some of the science behind it? Well, it's too soon to say exactly what... Uh, the reasons are behind this this finding. And I do believe as we get more data and more people are vaccinated with this vaccine, maybe at the end, you know, in the next few months, when more data is available, um, we'll see a higher efficacy coming about, uh, closer to 90%, you know, in everybody. But again, it's too soon to say that. This is the data that we have today. It's certainly better than what we expected it to be. Um, or the world expected it to be because, you know, initially, if you're trying to make a vaccine very quickly, you don't know if it's going to be more than 50 or 60 percent effective. So, um, again, how much longer before the, the phase three trial results are um, unveiled in the United Kingdom? So I'll answer that in two parts. You've already got this data point with which I think they're all going to now apply uh, for the emergency use ah. uh, licensure in the UK, and we've tied up, of course, with the MHRA and the Drug Controller's Office here is working with them to get an exchange of that data so that we can also apply for the same over here. Coming to your point of when will the final licensure come where, you know, it'll be available to the general public, I would say another two to three months. But before that, the good news is based on this result, based on the data we have in India, we can expect within the next one month, we can try to get an emergency use licensure uh, done even in India, of course, based on what the Drug Controller of India deems fit in terms of safety and efficacy for the people. So how soon uh, would you uh, believe you'd be in a position to ask for uh, em emergency uh, usage permissions here in India based on what's being done in the UK? Uh, a couple of weeks? Uh, just I think that's, when a, would you apply? that's a good guess. You know, um, uh, once the UK MHRA grants it and we're trying to get the data being shared between the two regulators at the same time, um, we're probably talking about another two to three weeks. That's why I'd always mentioned and targeted for end of the year, um, unless there's any major hiccup, um, we feel confident um, 
uh, to be on that uh, on track. And, okay. But let me just clarify that the emergency use licensure, both in the UK and here, will mean that you can only give it to limited to a limited scope. You know, the vulnerable, the healthcare workers, the elderly. So at least you know you take care of that population, which is highest at risk. And then, as I said, two or three months later for the general public. Uh, how soon would you be in a position, and uh, in, in terms of numbers of doses, to roll that out to, uh, to doctors, paramedics, cleaners, hospital staff, frontline people? Uh, how soon can you have it out to every part of the country, just for them? No, so um, as I said, in the, by January, we should have you know, 100 million doses minimum because we've already made 40 million doses, and uh, if not more. Uh, by January. So January, February, you know, we can start rolling out hundreds of millions of doses because the target set by the government of India and all the uh, people that we've been talking to, um, and they've also publicly announced that they are looking at three to 400 million doses by July 2021. Um, you know, of course, we don't know if they're going to buy all of that from us. Maybe they'll get a bit of that from Pfizer and other companies, uh, Moderna even. But again, with the um, pricing that they have set, I don't know if it would be uh, possible for us to be able to buy those vaccines, whether it's India or most other countries in the world as well. So that's why at the moment, you know, there's a lot of um, interest and excitement uh, that we're able to provide this vaccine at a very low price. I didn't want to come down in slabs. I wanted to offer the best possible price, even if that meant we wouldn't make a lot of profit at all, in fact, with the initial doses that we roll out, because this price is normally given when you know you reach hundreds of millions of doses because of the economies of scale. Um, whereas the other companies have chosen probably to initially take a high price and then as volumes go up, we hope that they would bring down that price. And what is the price for you? So as we've said, you know, uh, we're putting an MRP of a thousand rupees. In the private market, we'll sell it at five to six hundred rupees, giving another couple of hundred rupees to the distributors and others to be able to make their margins so that they can really give the product to everybody. But to the government of India, um, they will be buying it at 250 rupees or less, which is roughly $3 a dose because of the volumes that they'll be buying it at. And you know, that's what we want to contribute to our country you know, for 90% of our volumes because most of that 90% is what's going to go to the government of India and maybe 10% to the private market at the higher price. So that's how we're doing it so that, you know, even the government can manage its huge budgets that are required, you know, for the population that we have. And of course, as you know, it's a two dose vaccine. So I've tried, we've tried our best at Serum to give the absolute lowest price, at least during the pandemic period, uh, to the government of India. And is that price 250 rupees uh, per dose or is it uh, collectively? Per dose. That's it's right. per dose. So 500 rupees. Everything uh, I've said is per dose. Everything That's you've right. said is per dose. And that 10% that you said, which might be available outside what you supply the government, would that be available from day one or would that only be available after doctors, medical staff, frontline workers, they are dealt with? Correct. So as I said, that will tie in with the permissions in February, March, which will probably come for a full and final licensure. Uh, so, you know, till March, I don't think the general public would be able to get it um, very easily. Uh, they would have to go to the government uh, points and uh, areas where it's being distributed. And if they're eligible, then they'll get it from the government. And if not, then they'll just have to wait till March because that's the priority in which not only do we want to vaccinate our most vulnerable, but also in terms of the regulatory pathway, that's how much time it will take. So both will come together, you know, in the next three months. But, you know, we're hoping for this emergency use licensure so that by end of December, January, we can start rolling out some quantities. And what about the phase three trials taking place here in India now? Um, the government wants that data as well. So, uh, and yet they are accepting data, obviously, from what, whatever happens yes. in, in the United Kingdom. So is it just going to take more time as they analyze all of this? No, so that's also uh, uh, going on well because everybody by the 14th or 15th of December, or even sooner than that, will have received the second dose in India um, uh, for the entire enrollment that we've done, which means we will have some safety and some immunogenicity data um, for those. Of course, the idea is that why the question would be, why is that not the end of the trial? Because 
there's usually a two, three month uh, or, and six month follow up after any trial, you know, to uh, monitor safety and efficacy. So as long as we have that interim data um, of having given the second dose and then having waited a few days to see how, what the response is from the human beings, that's good enough. And that combined with the UK uh, MHRA uh, data uh, uh, approval uh, as well will be what the Indian regulator will have to weigh up and then see whether it's worthy of a Indian uh, licensure um, by the end of December. Okay, and let's right. talk a little bit about uh, the drug as well. Um, it works well among senior citizens, right? Yes, that's the good news. Um, and um, what is the age group? So above 55, right? And uh, 55 to 69, was it? And then above 70. Uh, so it, it's all good they, news they, there, right? Yeah, so, you know, anyone from the age of 18 upwards, so there have been different age groups, of course, but I think it goes all the way up to 90, so it's safe, you know, to even go up to that age group. Um, what about it's children? Only that below 18 yeah. is something which will be tested, and, you know, uh, we'll have to go very carefully on that because uh, traditionally for all vaccines and new drugs, you first prove safety, long-term safety, even in adults, before going into children, which is the right way to go about um, anything. But the good news, of course, is that we all know that it's not so bad um, for the younger population, and therefore, you know, it might not so be, be so bad for them to wait another few months, um, and rightly so, for the safety to be proven in additional studies that we're going to do both in India and abroad to prove that it is perfectly safe in children because you don't want to uh, uh, do something hasty there either. So those beneath the age of 18 will not be getting their drugs, uh, this vaccine, from, from March onwards or whenever it is. It would be a few months later by yes. when uh, there would be a further regulatory process. Yeah, I think, um, you know, both um, Oxford and AstraZeneca and other vaccine developers for that matter will have to do subsequent studies in the below 18 age group um, because that's, you know, the, the usual way, normal way that everybody goes about proving the efficacy and safety in adults first. So I would say probably end of next year is when we could probably look at, you know, um, giving it to children or below the age of 18. Uh, there's a lot which has been written about uh, the, the drug itself, the fact that uh, it's, uh, it's based a lot on science, which is uh, which you know you have the Serum Institute has, has worked on a, a lot in the past, as opposed to say Moderna and Pfizer, which have a, a different science involved, uh, mRNA or whatever it is. Could you tell our viewers the basic difference in the science uh, and why that's important? Well, the messenger RNA technology is a great technology, but um, you know it's experimental in the sense that no vaccine on this planet before COVID vaccines have been developed, have ever succeeded in giving a good response using messenger RNA technology. Mm. Um, whilst innovation is great and good, I've always said during a pandemic, we need to keep things simple and stick to proven technologies, proven manufacturing processes, you know, because if you want to ramp up and scale up very quickly, um, you don't want to be reinventing the wheel somewhere. But, you know, having said that, it's a great achievement uh, to have even these vaccines. Um, stability is always an issue because of the cold chain um, refrigeration conditions that we all know about with messenger RNA. So there are always pluses and minuses. As you've seen, the excellent efficacy results um, with the vaccine, it's 90%, maybe even higher later on. So these are the pros and cons using different technologies and uh, processes. But we need to keep in mind, you know, when you make new vaccines, are they going to be manageable in terms of logistics? Are they going to be affordable um, and have long-term protection? We don't know how much, uh, how many months or years these new technologies can protect you for because there just isn't enough data right. that we can see, you know, um, having used uh, this technology in the past. Whereas if you look at the chimp adenovirus or other live attenuated vaccines, killed vaccines, protein sub, spike protein vaccines, there's enough data to show how it's going to react, what kind of protection it will give, um, uh, the safety profile. Even if you look at the Oxford AstraZeneca product, it's been proven the technology platform is improving for the Ebola vaccine and other things they've used it for. So that was always, when you asked me earlier on also, why did we partner with them so early is because we knew that if anything, this vaccine platform is 
one of the safest out there, having time tested proven in the past. So uh, uh, these are the sort of differences between all these sure. uh, technologies and processes. Well, other, uh, I, I think at the end of this interview, one has to say that it's time to start counting the days. Uh, because, um, you know, we've been talking about months, then weeks, and when will the results yeah. come, and will it work? I think those answers are now coming in fairly fast and furious. I think it's just going to be uh, another couple of months. That seems clear. People have waited yeah. so long. Uh, Adar Punawala, thanks very much for being with us this evening.